So if you've ever seen anything with inverses, here's the process you probably learned, or at least a variant on it, to get the inverse of a given function. Replace f of x with y, solve for x, noting that if this is not a function, then the inverse doesn't exist. Switch x and y, then replace y with f inverse of x, so you get y is equal to something in terms of x. And sometimes, especially in this book, you'll see a little bit of a rearrangement there where you put step two before step three, which I think actually makes it considerably worse, considerably less helpful, but roughly this is how you probably see it. And to an extent, it is a valid approach. So if you think about the problem that I had in the last example, that thing with costs, if I remove the things like C and T and just talk about that in terms of X's and Y's, that approach does work just fine. If we say that f of x is equal to 150x plus 50, then we replace f of x with y, y equals 150x plus 50, then we are going to solve for x, so I should fix that, independent variable, excuse me, and that would mean subtracting over 50 divided by 150, you get y minus 50, equal over 150, excuse me, is equal to x. And this is actually where I'd say that you're done. Because at this point you have identified the function that undoes our original function. But the book says we should go further, swap these two. I'm also going to swap the order of the equality. And we will get y equals x minus 50 over 150. And we'll call that f inverse of x and be done with it. And technically, yeah, that's the inverse of that function. But there are a couple of problems with this approach as I see them. For one, when you're doing this sort of thing, if you have that step where especially the big bad one, in my opinion, is the step of swapping the variable names back to get things in that nice, comfortable x in, y out relationship again, you're kind of removing the entire point of the problem and making it some weird and arbitrary notation chase where like the inverse is just the thing that happens to be there and it doesn't really do anything special or be anything special except in that one really cool case where like these two things happen to work. And isn't it cool if they happen to work? Like they're not a actual tangible specific thing generated specifically to work here. So that's that's part of the problem. And the other big issue that I have with this is it kind of hides all of the abstract depth of the idea of an inverse as a mathematical concept. Because anytime you're talking about something, some sort of action, whether it's a function or any of the other things you can do with math, you should always want to think about what the opposite of it is. I think of the Newton's laws. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, and just renaming things to get a different funky looking thing in terms of x kind of takes away that oppositeness of the inverse and just makes it a thing that happens to happen to work. So when we're talking about these problems, I think it's very important that you kind of avoid that third step entirely, that you avoid that step of talking about switching the, vari the variables back to put yourself in that nice comfortable world of x's and y's, because even though that world is comfortable in what you're used to, it's not very helpful in this case, because the essential relationship of a function and its inverse is that if f of x equals y, we must have that f inverse of y equals x. Assuming it exists, but that's something we'll talk about later. Anyway, for now, let's get an example where we approach things the way I think you should. So here we want to find the inverse of f of x equals x cubed minus 1. And if you want to know how the book says you should do this, read the book. This is actually one of the examples directly from there. I'll take examples directly from the book every now and then, especially if they have nice graphics. But generally, for one, I don't find their examples that compelling. And two, I want you guys to have an extra resource for other examples if you're looking for them. In this case here, I'm not going to use the book's approach. I'm going to use my approach, with I th which I think is both simpler and more illuminative. So we have that function there. We're going to say y is equal to x cubed plus 1. And then we're just going to solve for x. Subtract 1. y minus 1 equals x cubed. And then I'm going to swap the sides. x is equal to the cube root of y minus 1. 
and that's it. Or, to be more specific, x is equal to f inverse of y. And the fact that we have f inverse of y instead of just being f inverse of x equals some other y, make sure that we understand that this is specifically a thing that we have found to reverse the way that that one works. It is a unique thing made for this context. That's the most important part, in my opinion, of an inverse, that it has a specific reactive property for the action we're starting with. But if you wanted to write this as f inverse of x, you could just say f inverse of x equals the cube root of x minus 1. It has the same meaning, it's just a little bit less clean. And we'll talk about that cleanliness more when we look at things with graphing these, but the next thing I want to talk about is what it might mean for a function to not have an inverse. That is, for an inverse to not be able to exist.